Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this chapter was quite dense. We addressed complex and technical issues relating to the protection of prisoners of war, civilians, and wounded and sick in international and non-international armed conflicts. I have the immense pleasure to welcome today our guest expert for this chapter, the very well-known expert in international humanitarian law and human rights law, Andrew Clapham. Andrew is currently a professor at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Professor Clapham, we are very happy to have you on board in this course. I will ask you four very general questions. Are you ready to start with the first question? Oh, indeed, yes, I'm ready. Thanks a lot. All persons who do not fall into one of the categories envisaged in Article 4 of Geneva Convention 4, even if they participate in the hostilities in the context of an international armed conflict, will not benefit from POW status. This does not mean that they will remain unprotected. These individuals, referred to as sometimes unprivileged combatants or unlawful combatants or even terrorists, should in principle benefit from the protection offered by Geneva Convention 4 to enemy nationals living in the territory of the belligerent state and to inhabitants of occupied territories. Do you agree that uh, so-called members of a terrorist organizations should be assimilated with civilians while they actively participate in the hostilities? In short, uh, yes, for the purposes of protection under the Fourth Geneva Convention, um, as you've suggested, you're either a prisoner of war or you're a civilian. There's no gap in the scheme of the four Geneva Conventions, and Pictet uh, said that many years ago. Where uh, things need to be slightly nuanced, perhaps, is that uh, somebody who is directly participating in hostilities does lose their protection from attack. So while they can be attacked, uh, they still don't lose their civilian status if they're captured and interned. And in recent years, there's been a slight blurring of this line that the theory has run, well, if you can be attacked, you can be um, interned as some sort of unlawful combatant. But that's not how the Geneva Conventions work. I would like now to ask you a set of questions dealing with the protections of civilians under Geneva Convention 4. According to a traditional interpretation of Geneva Convention 4, only two types of territory are protected by these conventions. A belligerent party's own territory and an occupied territory. This means that civilians who fall into the power of an invading force, which is not carrying out operations on its own territory, or which has not acquired control sufficiently to be treated as an occupying power are left outside the scope of application of Geneva Convention 4. Therefore, such civilians are not protected by provisions contained in these conventions, in particular by those prohibiting ill treatment, forcible deportation or arbitrary detention. Why is that so? In other words, could you explain the reason which justify this important territorial limitation. And then, uh, if you could propose um, solutions in order to remedy this gap. Well, it's true, this is a tricky area. Um, on a first reading of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it does appear that there is a gap for the protection of civilians in the types of circumstances that you have just outlined in the sense that during the invasion phase, before the occupation, those civilians do not seem to fit into the relevant provisions of the Fourth Geneva Convention. However, my own impression is that these days that's a bit of a false problem. Uh, there are three ways of protecting those civilians. The, the first, and it's been suggested by my colleague here at the Geneva University, Professor Marco Sassoli, is that one can take a, a more flexible approach to the concept of occupation. And so where soldiers have captured somebody, they, in effect, are occupying the ground on which that person is being captured. And therefore, that person has fallen into the hands of the enemy 
and therefore the, the protections for occupied territory apply in a more sort of functional and flexible way. That's one approach. Um, a second approach... Uh, could, could you just um, uh, explain whether these, these fear is usually shared by a member state or by the, by the ICRC or whether this fear is, um, is still very controversial? Yes, it's controversial in that it's not shared by anyone and maybe that's because there are other ways to get to the same result. But having said that, in my own work I recently came across a government in fact arguing uh, that theory not because they wanted to offer the protection of the Fourth Geneva Convention to people during the invasion phase but they wanted to draw on the occupiers rights before the occupation. So during the Iraq war some Iraqis were interned before the occupation actually took place in, in the formal sense. But the governments wanted to say well we have the right to intern because the functional theory of occupation would cover even the invasion phase. So it would be too quick to say that governments have rejected that theory. Of course they're using it there to claim privileges rather than grant rights so maybe we shouldn't be so surprised. But I wouldn't dismiss the theory too quickly, even if some people have done. But I think, as I've said, I think you can get to the same result with two other routes. The, the second route would be to say that um, Article 75 of Protocol 1 does fill the gap because it covers all people in the hands of the enemy. And even if the two states concerned were not parties to Protocol 1, it is widely considered to be customary international law and indeed recently the United States government has said that it will be applying Article 75 as a matter of customary international law because it feels under a sense of legal obligation to do so. So I think rather than worrying too much about that gap, one can say that it's filled by Article 75 or custom as you prefer. The third way to fill the gap would be to say that human rights law applies in that situation and the sorts of things that you were suggesting, um, such as mistreatment of somebody in your control, would be covered by human rights law. So I would be very hesitant to suggest that there's any sort of gap in protection there. The first set of questions that I would like to ask you relate to occupation. As you know, the regime of occupation does not apply in non-international non armed conflicts. What happens if non-state actors occupy part of the national territory? Are they bound by certain minimal obligations? Should the law of occupation as envisaged in international armed conflict apply by an analogy in the context of non-international armed conflict? Would uh, this uh, regime make sense for non-state actors which may have limited abilities to comply with detailed IHL norms? And then lastly, what role human rights law could play in this context? Could it also apply to non-state actors in order to fill gaps in international humanitarian law? Thank you. Well, I think I'll take the last question first. I do think that human rights law can apply to a non-state actor in such a situation where they're in control of people. And so to answer your question, it could fill some of the gaps which you have highlighted. Would it be a good idea to apply the law of occupation to a non-state actor in control of territory? My answer is no. I don't think it works. For the reasons which you've hinted at in the question, the armed group might not be able to fulfill all of the obligations to the letter in the way that they're set out. But perhaps more important than that, the law of occupation gives the occupier certain privileges which I referred to in the previous question. So it would be to suggest that the armed group has the right to intern people who represent imperative risks to security, even before they'd committed any crime or done any danger. So it would be odd if states decided to agree that rebel groups would have the right to intern or the right to interfere with property rights for reasons of military necessity. So to be honest I think it's better to consider some of the more basic fundamental rights that the armed group has to respect 
rather than trying to apply a regime which is set up for an interstate conflict. What would be the IHL obligations that the armed group has? Well, they would have all the obligations under Common Article 3, so they would have to treat people in their detention properly, they would have to offer them some sort of fair or impartial procedure. Um, obviously, all forms of uh, torture and experimentation and all of that sort of thing is completely prohibited. And then they would have some more detailed obligations from Protocol 2, which would apply um, to those groups that control territory. And obviously, if we're talking about an occupation type situation, that's going to apply to those groups. And of course, lastly, there would be, to fill the gaps if you like, all the customary international law in the big red book of the ICRC, which would apply to the armed groups to the extent that that custom applies in non-international armed conflicts. So rather than seeking to squeeze the law of occupation into a situation which it's not designed for, I would prefer to use the existing IHL and human rights law, which from my perspective would cover most eventualities. So you think it would cover practically everything and uh, enough obligations of the state vis-à-vis -vis the civilian population which is occupied, the, the, the basic needs that needs to be offered to uh, the civilian population in situation of occupation. I don't think that Common Article 3 and Additional Protocol 2 would cover that. It would be very limited. Well, that's a good point, to the extent that obviously a state has greater resources usually than the armed group. Um, one would have to adjust uh, providing for the basic needs of the population. But again, because I have a wide reading of human rights law, for me, the armed group would be obliged to respect the right to water, the right to food, even the right to education. So to the extent that they were hindering those rights, they would be in violation of international law, but there would also be expectations that they could fulfill those rights. And as you know, in many non-international armed conflicts um, around the world, armed groups do step in to play those sort of state-like functions because they need the cooperation of the local population. And in a way, if they're fighting for the rights of the local population, it makes sense to provide food and water and education and housing to the extent that they can. That's not, of course, the case for all conflicts, but some sort of high-level civil wars, that would be what you would see. The fourth set of questions that I wish to ask you deals with internment in non-international armed conflict. As you know, the laws governing non-international armed conflict does not expressly recognize a right to detain combatants, nor does it specify the grounds for a procedure by which a person may be detained. Moreover, it is unclear whether any legal basis for internment in non-international armed conflicts currently exists in customary international humanitarian law. Would it be appropriate to apply the law of international armed conflicts by analogy to members of armed groups when arrested and detained by state armed forces? In that case, would it make sense to refer to the legal regime applicable to POWs? Or would it be more appropriate to apply the legal regime applicable to civilians internees by Geneva Convention 4? Do you think that a specific legal regime of internment should be created for non-international armed conflicts? Or do you think that the concurrent operation of international humanitarian law and international human rights law could ameliorate uh, the problems which arise in non-international armed conflicts? Um, again, I'll take the last question first and work back upwards. So, my view is that the better solution would be to have um, the two regimes working side by side. The international humanitarian law, to the extent that it applies, and then international human rights law, which can fill in, if you like, some of the gaps in non-international armed conflict. Um, I think the basic principles of human rights law when somebody is being detained can easily be applied to a non-international armed conflict situation. So the right to challenge your reason for detention, the right to have an impartial tribunal or some sort of administrative body hear the complaint, and the right to present your evidence. I think all of that is, is fairly feasible. So I would argue for human rights law to be used in these situations. 
rather than, as you were suggesting in the first two questions, the existing regimes either for prisoners of war or for occupied territory. And here is why. The prisoner of war regime is, as you know, very sophisticated and complete and it allows for um, very important access by the ICRC and other privileges. But of course it also includes, in an unwritten way for some prisoners of war, combatant immunity. So that a prisoner of war who is a member of the armed forces cannot be prosecuted for simply participating in hostilities. In a non-international armed conflict, states are not going to accept that the so-called terrorists that they're fighting, or maybe they really are terrorists, whether they're rebels, terrorists, or insurgents, whatever you want to call them, the state is not going to accept that these people cannot be prosecuted and have immunity for taking up arms against that state. And so the regime for prisoners of war, for me, doesn't seem to apply in a sensible way to a non-international armed conflict because once captured, the rebels are often going to be prosecuted for treason or having taken up arms or terrorism. Terrorism even writ wide in some national laws which would include firing on the armed forces of the state so that the system doesn't really work for a non-international armed conflict. Should you apply the analogous idea of civilians in occupied territory? Again, in an occupied territory, the occupier has the right through the Fourth Geneva Convention to set up internship camps and intern people who represent a threat to security. Are you going to allow for an armed group to intern people on the grounds that it thinks they might threaten its security in the future? without necessarily having all the procedural possibilities that a state has in an occupied territory. I think it's asking for trouble to mix and match these regimes. I would prefer a system where it is tailored to the facts of the non-international armed conflict so that both the state, which should apply its national law and its international human rights obligations, and the armed group, which should apply international human rights law to the extent that it can be adapted to apply to them, apply it in that context and not pick and mix from the bits of either occupier's law or the law of prisoners of war, which to me will end up with the occupier or the belligerent or the rebel group actually simply taking the bits that they like and ignoring the other bits as saying they're not practicable. But you would agree that in a way or another, um, armed groups should have a possibility to detain uh, armed forces of uh, the state. I'm going to choose my words carefully. I'm not sure that, as you put it, they should have the possibility, because that would be to suggest that they have the right to detain people, and that would be to suggest that people could be basically detained until the end of the conflict, and for many of these civil wars or wars involving terrorist groups now, the war with the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Al-Nusra is going on for years and years and years to suggest that they could detain people that they capture as forever prisoners on either side seems to me to be unacceptable. So the idea that there is a right to detain I think needs to be treated with some caution. Where I would meet you is to say that of course people are detained and those detentions should be subject to some legal regime so that the people who are detained ought to be able to challenge the reasons they've been given for their detention before an impartial tribunal. That doesn't mean that without further justification there's a right to detain. It has to be justified according to some quite strict criteria. So, um, Professor Clapham, I wish to thank you a lot for um, uh, your participation to this MOOC and to and uh, the, the answers that you have provided to uh, the general question and controversial question that I have just posed. Thanks a lot.